I'm talking to Todd May about his book, Fragile Life, Accepting Our Vulnerability. Now, Todd, I thought maybe we could start with the beginning of your book in which you talk about some fairly personal issues that you've had that, while not necessarily uncommon in any way, it's not something that you read about, especially from a first-person perspective in many academic books. And I was wondering what you thought about in writing it and whether or not you, I guess, were perhaps worried about exposing yourself and making yourself as vulnerable as you do, or does that come with the idea and the central tenets of your book? Yeah, Chris, in in writing A Fragile Life, what I wanted not to do was make it some distant philosophical reflection. I wanted to have some immediacy. Uh, And I've dealt throughout my life with periods of depression. I mentioned this in the book, not the kind of debilitating depression that I can't get out of bed, but depression that I use with the, the image of the queen of darkness. She grips my shoulder and everything feels dark for periods of my life, uh, and running anywhere from a few days to actually up to a couple of months. And it just seemed to me that if I'm going to talk about how we deal with the fragility of our life, that I needed to, to put myself out there a little bit, talk a little bit about my own fragility, uh, and then address things from the angle of people really seeking to grapple with the fact that so many of us are vulnerable to suffering in different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I found it very powerful. I think, uh, for among other reasons, some of the stuff you're describing, I can definitely relate to. And otherwise, I'm I'm just thinking as a writer, as an academic, it's putting yourself out there. It's exactly what you're saying, making yourself vulnerable. Was that something that you worried about, or did that come to you? I guess um, out of your your own personal philosophy, making it easier for you. Yeah, I, ne- I never worried about putting up. I didn't have second thoughts, Chris. If that, that, that's what you're asking, whether I should do that. In the in the stuff that I've written, uh, I put myself out there a fair bit, and I I've never had the kinds of I, I guess I've never had anybody take advantage of it uh, in such a way as to make me feel bad. And I know we live in an age uh, where people's vulnerabilities are sometimes exploited, but that's never happened in my philosophical writing. Hmm. Well, yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting because, yeah, we don't often get uh, that kind of personal reflection in a book like this. And as we were talking about uh, before we started, you, you write in a way, as a number of people have commented on the back, uh, the people who have read your book and endorsed it, uh, you write in a way that's very accessible. Now, it's not something you generally see a lot of in philosophy is the comment, this is very accessible or, or this is uh, fairly easy – to understand on some level for any kind of audience, what goes into your writing that makes you uh, choose that kind of style? Well, uh, let me let me say something and then tell a little story. Right, the the thing I want to say is that I've always tried to be as clear as I can. Although, in, certainly in my early books, I was writing within the vein of a more technical philosophy. But I came to think, and here's the story: I came to think that what I was doing was not necessarily going to have an important message. And I came across uh, I came across a series called The Art of Living out of what was Acumen Press and has now been bought up by Routledge. And The Art of Living allowed you to propose books that had, they had to be short, they had to be clear, they had to have no footnotes, uh, and reflected the ancient Greek idea that philosophy was about the art of living. And I noticed that they had no books on death. So I thought, well, look, here's a chance for me to write something that would be significant if my kids read it. My kids don't, aren't necessarily going to become philosophers. And so I, I began to think, you know, it would be a shame if as I got older, my kids said, well, me and my dad's a philosopher. And people asked, so what wisdom did he give you? And they said nothing, right? He just wrote about <laughs> French philosophers, right? And that just didn't seem okay with me. So I decided that I would use this book on death to write rigorous philosophy for a broader audience. And a lot of my writing since then, uh, certainly the last two books that I've written, Fragile Life and the one before that, uh, the book that uh, that I've just finished writing on morality, all trying to take these 30-some years I've had in philosophy and use it to speak to a broader audience. Because I think philosophers often don't do that. It's a, and it's a shame because we, 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 we don't speak to broader audiences, even though we have something to say. 
And yet we complain because we're marginalized. And I'm thinking, yeah, if you need a PhD to read what we're writing, right, we're going to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you how do you weigh in? I've always I mean, this is something I struggle with myself. And I think a lot of uh, writers do, especially when they're early on trying to find their voice and then maybe looking back, as you've mentioned, thinking about your experience and how to share that with people. But I think of there's a quote, I I believe it's in the beginning of uh, Gender Trouble with Judith Butler, who talks about something. uh, She says basically that if you were to write in a way that everyone would understand, that you wouldn't necessarily be giving new ideas. Whereas if you write in something that makes people second guess or or something that complicates them and that isn't quite understandable the first time, perhaps there's value in that in forcing people to uh, to deal with the the writing itself. And I'm wondering, uh, I mean, that's one side, but then there's another side, which is uh, I always have uh, uh, admired Eric Michael Dyson, or Michael Eric Dyson, sorry, who uh, who's written a lot on uh, critical race theory and that. And he says that if you don't understand me, that's my problem. It's a problem from me, not from you. And so these are kind of two people that I really admire, Judith Butler, Michael Eric Dyson, but they have completely opposing views, it seems, based on those, uh, those essays on how to write. How do you, how do you negotiate between uh, that idea that, yeah, if it's easy to understand, then you can't be doing anything new or you can't be doing anything intellectually rigorous, uh, as some people might say. But then on the other hand, if you're inaccessible, then you're not doing much either. How do you, how do you negotiate that? Well, in, in this case, and I respect both of these thinkers, uh, Butler's just wrong. <laughs> Think of it this way, Chris. Right? You read a novel, a novel that you can read that gives you the experience of someone you don't know. Maybe, maybe the experience of somebody from a marginalized group. Right? You understand the words. Uh, you understand what's being said. And yet you're being brought into a situation where you are now being pulled outside of yourself into an experience that challenges your own experience. Uh, or you, you see a movie, right? uh, and that movie presents, uh, let's say, I don't, like 13th. I don't know if you know 13th. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, this is about the 13th Amendment that freed, that freed enslaved people on the one hand, okay. but allowed the exception for jail time, which then became the new slavery. Oh, the, the documentary, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one, okay. right? So, yeah. Right, and so you get you get done with that. And there's nothing I, there's nothing I don't understand in that film, mm-hmm. but you get done with that film, and you realize that you've just been challenged to see things in a way that you hadn't seen them before. It doesn't seem to me to require any kind of obscurity to challenge people and to put them in new positions. Which is not to say, Chris, that there's no role for uh, technical philosophy. I, I think there is a role. I think there. I think there are just some issues that are hard, and there's no way to make them easy to non-philosophical audiences. However, I think there's a lot fewer of them than people think, and I think among those things that people don't need to do is be obscure in order to challenge folks. Hmm. Well, I think definitely you do a good job in this book, A Fragile Life, and I'm wondering if you can say when at some point you started to really consider this issue of vulnerability as a, as a key thing to think about. Okay. It, well, the long answer, or the, which what the long period would be, I've been thinking about this for about 45 years. The short answer is that it, it, at some point a few years ago, I just thought, okay, now I know what I want to say. Um, uh, when I was young, uh, I was my my family had its emotional issues, and I was sort of emotionally taken under the wing of a teacher of mine, a high school teacher, who was a Taoist. And he believed that the world was ultimately a place, that the universe was ultimately benign. And that it wasn't, it wasn't harmful. And although I was deeply influenced by him, I, could, I always felt uncomfortable with that thought. And it always turned around for me, turned around for me. And I, you know, I studied uh, some Buddhism and I studied some Stoicism and I studied some Epicureanism, all of which appear in the book. And although I found these things attractive, I just was always thinking there's something holding me back from endorsing them. The the universe wasn't ultimately benign. It wasn't ultimately malignant either, but it was certainly wasn't ultimately benign. And and a a few years ago, I just thought, okay, I'm going to sit down and sort this out. And that's where the book came from. And, And asking the question, not 
how can we avoid suffering? Uh, because that's what these doctrines offer. But if we don't want always to avoid suffering, if we don't want to be the kinds of beings that are immune to suffering, where does that leave us? And how do we think about our relationship to our vulnerability to suffering? Hmm. When you talk about uh, the idea of a project, is sometimes the idea of a, a, I think it's a ground project, something that makes us uh, feel the way we are, something that gives us a sense of ourselves, the projects we work on. Uh, but you also say that this uh, thing that you're talking about, this acceptance of vulnerability, is not exactly the same as a project. I was wondering if you could talk about that and what that means. Yeah. And the, the term ground project comes from the philosopher Bernard Williams. And his idea was that there are certain projects that give us the se- our sense of who we are and what our life means. These are our, the central projects. If you eliminate those, then we l- can lose a grip on ourselves. Uh, he uses it for, so, for some other purposes, but that's, that's the rough idea. So being invulnerable to suffering – what some of the Stoics uh, and, and Buddhists and Taoists recommend is a project. You, you work on yourself to make yourself a person who's invulnerable to suffering because we could say our roughly natural state, and I don't want to pack too much into that term natural, but our roughly natural state is that we're vulnerable to suffering. But if we're vulnerable to suffering, then being vulnerable to suffering isn't something we have to work on. Right? What we have to work on is how we think about our relationship to it, right? What we do to, to accept the fact that we don't want always to escape suffering, um, but uh, that we do want to come, the way I sometimes put it is, we don't want to come to peace with it, but maybe some roving truce with it. And that becomes the project. How do we think about that? Now, uh, when you when you envision this uh, as work that somebody can do, how do you uh, how do you negotiate sort of focusing on this on this issue of vulnerability and invulnerability in relation to other things? Is this something that is a sort of ground project that can uh, influence almost all other aspects, or is this one of many other projects? The way I'm curious how you see this. Now, it's a really good question, Chris. I, t- I take you'd be asking. Um, do we set our relationship to vulnerability as a central project in our lives Mm -hmm. or is it something we do while we're doing other things? Yeah, well, you mentioned in the book, uh, it's interesting, I thought, that uh, the project of being invulnerable often appears as the central characteristic of whoever is doing it, right? It seems to have, because it's not something we see all the time, anyone who seems invulnerable seems like that's a central characteristic. But, of course, I don't think anyone would want to say that their central characteristic is vulnerability. So where does that uh, fit in and, like, does it, affect all of our other projects if we accept the kind of outlook you're, you're setting, or does it, is it one of many others that is, is sort of uh, compartmentalized? Yeah, I, I want to say that it, it's not compartmentalized on the one hand, but it doesn't necessarily affect all of our other projects on the other. It could involve a project in the sense that, it, and I talk about this in the book, that we take up, for instance, Buddhism or Taoism, Stoicism, for what I call small matters, right? So using myself as an instance here, right? I'm, I'm neurotic and obsessive about uh, being on time everywhere. Uh, and so if I'm on a train and the train gets stuck and there's a meeting and I'm going to be late for the meeting, my tendency is to freak out. Now, that's not a big deal that I'm going to be late for this meeting. So I could take up some of the elements uh, of, of these, uh, what I call invulnerableist philosophies, in order to calm myself down. So, for instance, uh, I, I talk about the contemporary uh, spiritual thinker, uh, Eckhart Tolle, and he says sometimes you just need to ask yourself, is anything wrong now? And I, I've actually used this. I, I've been on the subway, known when I was going to be late, said, look, is anything really wrong now? But when we talk about the relationship not to little things, but to larger matters, to, to suffering. Then I think that sometimes things, and this is, and this is where the suffering is, is something people, people don't want to walk away from, that there are some things that we don't even think that's appropriate to bring in. Uh, and so, Chris, if I can use an example here. In 
the case of uh, the Stoics, right? One of the things that Epictetus recommended, he says, when you put your child to bed every night, envision them uh, not dying during the night. And so that way, when they die, you'll be, you'll, you'll be ready and prepared for it, right? Now, for my part, it's not simply that I can't be prepared for it. I don't want to be prepared for that, right? I mean, if that if that's going to happen, I don't want to have – there's no equanimity that I want. So there's no project there to help me with that. I think the projects – what we're talking about are projects for smaller matters and then just thinking about the larger matters – coming to some kind of terms as best we can, but not overcoming the suffering that they involve. It's interesting to me that you've, uh, as you said, you've looked for in your own life and you've mentioned in this book, uh, philosophies that can be, that you kind of group together as invulnerable, having this thread of, uh, of invulnerability. So you have Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Stoicism, Epicureanism, um, But it's interesting. I mean, you're not that far away from where I am geographically. You're in South Carolina, if that's right. And, uh, you know, I'm in North Georgia, uh, sort of Bible Belt area. And I found it interesting the the absence of a lot of Christian theology or even Islamic theology and these other things, and instead to focus on that, um, on these sort of uh, definitely in terms of demographics, a much smaller uh, sampling of these ideas. I was wondering if you if you thought about that, if you purposely chose not to do the major religions and to focus on Buddhism, Taoism, or if there is something fundamentally different. Yeah, yeah. The- it, it, there, there were two related uh, matters here, and and I, and I did this deliberately, right? One is, I don't feel, given the the wide variety of different religious traditions with even within Christianity, that I felt a, enough of an expertise to get a grip on it. Right? Now, one could reply, and I think rightfully that there's that there is a wide variety of traditions in, the, in in Buddhism particularly uh, and I don't I don't deal with the different traditions I say I'm not going to deal with them but they, they center around the four noble truths and I use that and the two traditions uh, the Theravada uh, and uh, Mahayana to, to to broadly sort it out I, I thought that if I waded into to Christianity or Islam or Judaism uh, that I would be wading into an area where I I'm just not going to know my way around that well that's on the one hand and on the other hand, from what I do know about it, I, I, it seems to me that um, there's a more complicated relationship to suffering that's going on in these traditions. Um, it's it, it's not straightforwardly as it is sometimes, well, certainly in Buddhism's Four Noble Truths and, and, and presented in Taoism and Stoicism. It isn't a matter of overcoming our vulnerability to suffering. It's, it's teeing up a different and complicated relationship to it. Uh, and it seemed to me that in that sense, uh, these traditions, as much as I knew of them, were grouped outside the project that I was engaged in. Mm-hmm. It's also interesting in terms of the discipline that you find yourself in. I mean, you're you're obviously in philosophy, but this book, to me, has uh, elements that people could easily interpret as being uh, religious text or religious studies text, uh, as well as a self help text and possibly other ones. How do you how do you sort of pick and choose? I mean, especially yeah, the Eckhart Tolle uh, reference, for instance. I don't see that very much in the stuff I read in philosophy. Uh, he's seen I. Think think as outside of that and yet you, you use him in relation to a bunch of other people who are definitely within mainstream uh, academic philosophy and so how, how do you sort of pick and choose or do you even consider these kinds of disciplinary questions well uh, I've, I've come actually not to consider them uh, I was my if you look on my CV uh, it says that I do 20th century continental philosophy but my last few books involve no 20th century continental philosophy. And uh, when people ask me what kind of philosophy I do now, I'm, I'm more or less, Chris, reduced to shrugging and saying, I, I just do philosophy. The, the issues that I'm interested in are issues that people have to grapple with in their lives. Uh, and when I say people, I don't mean just philosophers. I mean people inside philosophy and people outside philosophy. So if we go back a couple of books, the, the, the Fragile Life book that we're talking about was preceded by a book called The Significant Life. And it was trying to talk about uh, 
ways in which we might think about the meaningfulness of our lives, right? And the death book uh, was a couple books before that, was how we think about our relation to death. The manuscript that I just finished uh, is a manuscript on living a moral life as opposed to being the kind of moral saint that was often set up in philosophy. I think these are just issues that we we all grapple with. And I'm, I'm trying to think them through for myself and having you know, spent some time studying these issues, try to offer something for people who are both in philosophy and thinking about their lives and outside philosophy. So I, I don't think terribly much about the, the disciplinary boundaries. Uh, and I also don't think much anymore, and I'm lucky because I, you know, I've published enough that I don't have to, I don't think much anymore about publishing in philosophy journals uh, where you, you're going to publish something, it's probably going to be a, a, a very small uh, contribution. Uh, it's going to be read by 10 to 20 people uh, and then going to be forgotten, which I, I, I should really add immediately right away is something that I that I did. And I think it's something that people that a lot of people earlier on in the career have no choice but to do. Uh, but I think we want to think once we hit that about how we might get past this and and start to take hold of uh, larger issues that, that, that matter to people regardless of what kinds of boundaries they have. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, as you said, you know, that's something uh, that early academics and scholars seem to have to do is to publish in the most uh, sort of difficult to access in terms of a general readership, these uh, venues, because that has the most, I guess, prestige or the most uh, respect in terms of a very small discipline, a very fine discipline. But then when you when you want to expand your readership, but also you want to see, feel like, I guess, you've making, you're making more of a difference, then people tend to go outside of those venues. I'm wondering if you think this is a good setup the way we have it in academia. I mean, I know I didn't make it and you didn't make it, but uh, we're, we're dealing with it. Is this something that you see changing with uh, perhaps technology and, and the way that we're accessing information now? Or is this something you think will um, unfortunately or fortunately continue? Is this kind of uh, very fine, small, niche um, venue for academics to publish in? And then maybe after tenure and these kinds of things, they can, they can be more widespread. Well, I, I think there's a value to the precision. But I think also that it's gone too far in that direction. So let me say a little bit about the first and then the second, that it, before you develop the kinds of precision and background and thinking about these issues and the sources that you read, then it, I, I think it's hard to say something that's gonna be new or different or striking for folks. So the journals and maybe the, and the small uh, you know, academic presses, these are ways, I think, for people to develop their chops and to have conversations with other philosophers right, who, who are thinking about these issues. So I do think there's a value to it. On the other hand, it does seem to me that in many cases, the concern has got narrower and narrower and narrower. So a friend of mine once commented that uh, the, the, the famous Strawson article, Freedom and Resentment, would probably never make a, a journal now. Uh, even though it's a, a groundbreaking article, it's too broad in scope uh, for people. So the, it, it seems to me that there there can be a ground which allows people to develop their chops and which puts them in conversation with people who will help them think through issues on the one hand. But it doesn't need, need to be so uh, obscure uh, that the stakes of whatever is written get smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. Well, I, again, I think that's something that we're all dealing with in terms of uh, selecting our our publication or selecting our uh, targets and uh, the way we write. I'm curious what you do now after writing this. I mean, in in this book in particular, uh, Fragile Life, you mentioned having taught a course on death that I think you said was the best course you've ever taught, is most successful, uh, uh, in, you know, for you. And yet you don't ever want to do it again, I think you said, because it was so sort of haunting and it, it left you waking up at night. And I assume you were writing or teaching that around the time that you were writing the book on death. And so do you do these things, these projects, if you want to call them that, and move on from them and hopefully get them out of your system? Or is this something that will stay with you and you'll continue to engage? Well, there's the, the way I think about it, Chris – apparently is very different from the way it actually is. The way that I think about it is that I do these projects and move on to the next thing. But people have pointed out to me 
that I do tend to circle back to certain themes. For instance, the theme of the fragile life circles back to the theme of uh, death that I, that I wrote about earlier. Uh, the theme uh, of having a significant life uh, and, the th- and writing about projects circles back to an earlier book in which I talked about people's identity being tied up with their practices and their projects. So I, uh, and in my political writings, which, although I'm always thinking this thing is new, uh, I think what I have probably in the end are new angles on something that is related to things that I've, I've thought about before. I mean, having, having said that, I do, and I think this is just sort of, this is maybe my own ADHD, right? I, I'm always looking for, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I know I know people who do both, right? I know people who uh, feel like there's a weight off their shoulders now that they've gotten these ideas into a book or into a journal article and they can move on from it. And then I know other people, of course, who uh, kind of stay with the same basic idea and see it, see them all as stepping stones or maybe as sort of building something bigger and better every time they add to it. But um, I'm wondering... Uh, in terms of your pro- – do you have a central project as you see it or is it something that just kind of happens without a necessarily a conscious registering for you? It's mostly, it's mostly the second. The, the, the people who have that, that central philosophical project, right? because that's what we're talking about, right, a philosophical mm-hmm. – people who have that, who stay with it and stay with it, stay with it, I think they're either like the best philosophers or the, or the utterly irrelevant ones, <laughs> Right, it, the other really relevant ones will say, stay with it, stay with it, stay with because they have they have nothing really to add and they're afraid of, of moving out. But the, a lot of the philosophers that I read and respect are people who really hang on to an idea for a long time. And I've I've long thought that I'm neither bright enough nor patient enough to hang on to the issues the way some of the people I really respect hang on to them. So my goal is to is to write something that I think might be meaningful to folks to write it as well as I can and on the thought that I'm pro- I'm certainly not going to have the last word on this but maybe I, I will have one of the words that will spur other people to think about this more or to incorporate it into the into their lives now that said if you if you could only take a few philosophers with you in your intellectual tool bag who who has who has helped you uh, having read them who has helped you I guess come to to be the person you are intellectually, is there any? But is there if is there a few people that you would not be able to do anything without them? When I was working on French philosophy, there were, there were three that were really helpful. Uh, when I started out in philosophy, I was reading the French philosopher uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, and he really grabbed me in a way nobody had ever grabbed me before philosophically. Uh, later, I read Michel Foucault, who did the same thing, right? and after that. Uh, there's a f- not very well-known French thinker, Jacques Rancière, uh, and he helped me think through a number of political issues uh, that I had been uh, that I had been puzzling about. Uh, more recently, I think perhaps the most important philosopher that I seem to keep be coming back to and working off is Susan Wolf. Uh, she's a philosopher, uh, University of North Carolina, wrote a book called Meaning in Life and Why It Matters. Uh, that's where my significant life book took off of, uh, of something that she left aside, which I thought was important, although still within her perspective. It's probably Susan Wolf will be the most influential one, although I, you know, I've read stuff by Bernard Williams and by Thomas Nagel that I've found provocative, but not as central for me as Wolf's work. Mm-hmm. Well, and what, uh, if you could sort of summarize for people who aren't familiar, what idea or a couple ideas uh, does that work provide to you? Well, you know, what Wolf wanted to do uh, in this book, Meaning in Life of Why It Matters, is say, look, there are, we tend to think in terms of two normative categories, right? The morally good and the happy. And she said there's another space here, which she wanted to call the space of meaningfulness. And that space is not one where you're necessarily happy and not one where you're necessarily morally good. But as she defined it, she said, it's where subjective attraction meets objective attractiveness, where you're doing something that engages you and grips you, but it's something worthwhile, although not necessarily moral. And she, so in her book, she isolates that space. What she doesn't do is talk about how we might think about objective worthwhileness. And she consciously leaves this open. She says she's leaving this open. 
Uh, and the Significant Life book, the one I wrote before, the Fragile Life book, is an attempt to try to say, here's one way of thinking about what makes uh, objective worthiness. And it's a way that she hadn't really opened up. Uh, so that I, I take off from her, but then I, I'm, I'm trying to add what seems to me an element that needs to be there if this perspective is really going to get a grip on us. Mm-hmm. Well, in a fragile life, is there something, a key element that you hope any or all readers will take away with them? I could put it this way, but I'm going to have to use a, a semicolon. <laughs> uh, on the one hand, we needn't be afraid of the fact that we suffer. And on the other hand, there's a way to think about that and place it so it won't necessarily overwhelm us except in extreme cases. That would be it. I'm curious, actually, I mean, I remember you in the book mentioning this as well, the fact that you will, I think you used the term freak out or, uh, or control freak, you, you used the term control freak, and then uh, talking about being late in a train. Do you envision a difference between somebody who is freaking out being late for a meeting in a train before having read A Fragile Life and after having read A Fragile Life? Do you envision them doing anything differently? Well, I, I certainly hope so. I mean, what I hope is that they won't freak out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that they can tell the tell the story. Okay, this is a, this is a small matter. This this doesn't this isn't a big deal. Uh, and 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 Chris, I do it myself, right? Um, I didn't stop being a control freak just because I finished the book, but that I will sit and I and I actually sat recently in a subway because in New York because the subways in New York seem barely to be functioning anymore. Unclear whether I was going to make my flight back from the city and. Telling myself, you know, that you, you wrote the book, right? This is not mm-hmm. a big matter, right? This is mm-hmm. this is something that you can deal with, and it helped. Although, as as the as ancient philosophers knew, and as the recently deceased French philosopher of, of ancient thought Pierre Hadot said, you don't get this stuff by just telling it to yourself, right? It involves exercises. You do this, you do this over and over again, right? That that's the project part, right? Mm-hmm. So you do this over and over again. Uh, until you sort of get to a sense where you can do this. And being in an environment that encourages this is helpful. So quick story here. I was in a, a, on a flight. I, I teach a lot in Denmark, and I gave a talk in Oslo with a, a guy that I knew, and we were flying back to Denmark. It's an hour flight uh, from Oslo, and we got on the plane, and the plane sat there, and it sat there for an hour sat there for two hours, sat there for two and a half hours. The guy, the pilot finally said, look, why don't you just guys get, get off the plane? You know, don't get a snack. This, is, this could be a while. Uh, we found out later there was some wildcat strike going on at the Copenhagen airport. And I'm starting to get agitated, right, because we're really late. But I'm noticing that nobody around me is getting agitated. And I realized, and I talked to, to, to my friend that I, have, I was teaching with later, I, I realized that I actually didn't have to get agitated. It's what, it wasn't required that I get agitated. And he said, he said, well, you know, you know, a lot of us Scandinavian folks, we think, look, you know, nobody's gotten hurt, nobody's died, so everything's probably basically okay. And being in that atmosphere, being in that context helped me, right? It helped me not freak out when I realized that, that freaking out was actually voluntary. It wasn't required. Hmm. That sounds very different than I can imagine the New York subway system. It was not the same in the New York. Now, <laughs> there, there were you know, many rolled eyes, a lot of shifting in seats, uh, and then the muttering started. Mm-hmm. Is there a benefit to being vulnerable that you see as, uh, as something that people don't recognize enough? I, I want to be very careful in answering this question, Chris, because I don't think that being vulnerable has any moral superiority over being invulnerable. I've been asked this uh, before. It's not as though I think you ought to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think people, I've met people who sort of more or less stages of invulnerability, never complete, but certainly I've met a couple that a good distance toward invulnerability. I don't think of them as any less than anybody else. It's, It's rather that I think most of us simply don't want to be in that space, right? We don't want to, we don't want to be reconciled in the wake of our children's death. The example I sometimes use is, do you remember when that Malaysian flight went down a few years ago and it took forever to find out where it was? Mm -hmm. People were gathering in these waiting rooms and 
I said, you know, suppose somebody could walk in there in those waiting rooms and say, look, I know you're missing your loved ones, but if you follow me, I could stop you this all the suffering you're going through. And suppose it were true, and suppose they knew it to be true, right? How many people would have followed them? I, I think practically none. They don't. It's not that we want to suffer. It's that we, we, we most of us want to be the kinds of beings that are capable of suffering under certain occasions. Doesn't make us better. Doesn't isn't an ideal. It's just that's the sense of who we are. And for most of us, it's related to the fact, and this is something I talk about in the book, that it's related to the fact that we care. Right. That for us. Caring involves the possibility of suffering, and caring is what helps gives our lives meaning. So that if we found ourselves not suffering about things, we would wonder about the meaningfulness of the trajectory that our lives have taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that to be a powerful part of your within the book talking about how if we didn't if we didn't have that aspect, it wouldn't it wouldn't seem meaningful, right? And if and but yet we don't want that or we don't like it. But if we did somehow get rid of it, well, we probably, I mean, we wouldn't find any value to it. Yes, that's right. I, I, and, I, and again, Chris, I don't want to say that that is necessarily all of us or that it makes us better people. Uh, what I'm trying to get at here is more, this is how I think how most of us think about ourselves. And now let me offer a way that I think would be helpful to frame it. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you are... Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I guess you gotta you gotta answer this question first: is whether or not you're done with vulnerability in terms of an intellectual thing that you're going to work with. Um, but if you are, where do you go from there? Where do you move on to from vulnerability? Okay, so th this <laughs> this goes back to something I mentioned before, right? Uh, I think I'm done uh, with it. I think I've said what I have to say, and those who know me and have followed the stuff that I write will be happy to tell me that I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, that I'm going to come back. So it's one way or another, right? But the way I see myself moving on is, is, is writing a, you know, I said I've finished a manuscript on, uh, on vulnerability, I'm sorry, on, on morality. And, and I was asked to do something that's completely different and exciting to me. Uh, there's a guy running a series for Bloomsbury Books called Philosophical Filmmakers. And he has asked me if I wanted to join the series. It's a series of short books where a philosopher writes on a director. Uh, and you don't have to be a film expert to do it. So you write on a director that's moved you. Right? And now that, I'm, now that I'm in the middle of saying this, I realize that I'm already circling back to the vulnerability book. <laughs> <laughs> so who are you writing on? Well, I'm writing on the director, Kenneth Lonergan, uh, who has only three – he's a playwright, has three films – the most recent one, I don't know if you, Chris, you know Manchester by the Sea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Have you seen that? Yeah, it was, I thought it was really powerful. It's very powerful, right? And he's, and he's written two others. Uh, this is his most recent one, both of which are very powerful. And, and all of which involve three themes, right? Uh, one is self-deception, uh, which I've taught about and thought about and haven't written about before. Uh, one is moral complexity. All his characters are much more complicated morally. Than, than one often finds in philosophy where you have, you know, characters which are flatter, right? Uh -huh. And the third one, right, is how does one live in the face of suffering that one can't overcome? Uh, and, of course, Manchester by the Sea is, you know, if it's about anything, it's about that. Uh -huh. uh, and having said that I'm on this completely new project, I, I am in the sense that I'm writing about a filmmaker. I've never done this before. But one of the three themes I'm going to be discussing is suffering that you can't overcome. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like interesting. Do you know when that's going to be out? Well, uh, the first thing they have to do is accept my proposal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I got to write the damn book. So I'm, I'm hoping that within, you know, two years, the thing will be out. All right. But it's just, it's, it's, it's a brand new project. I'm really excited about it. Uh, it feels new. It feels fresh. Uh, you know, I'm sitting there and watching films and thinking about them in ways I've never thought about them before. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm all at the very beginning of something that I'm hoping will work out. I think that I think Bloomsbury will take the proposal. Uh, and if they do, I'm going to be off and running. I'm going to try to get a, uh, an interview with Lonergan and then and then try to sort out this book over the next year or so. That sounds really exciting. I, I know uh, I'd be happy to read that when that comes out and I'll be looking for it. Uh, I'm curious in your in your grand scheme of things, is there a central idea 
I know you said you don't have uh, necessarily a, a project that you want to stay with, but would would vulnerability be one of your central ideas looking back on all the things that you've done and including this project that you're going to work on? Or is there anything else that seems to be, in retrospect, central to what you what you find important and interesting philosophically? I, I would put it this way, Chris, that, that vulnerability is an offshoot of something else, which is that I, I went into philosophy – asking about how might we live and what are our lives all about? And in some sense, everything I've written, both politically and otherwise, it tries to grapple with those questions, right? How is it that we might live and what is it to be who we are? And in different ways, the people that I've read have, have been gripped by that question. And the fact that we're vulnerable is, is an aspect of who we are. And how we think about it and come to terms with it is an aspect of how we might live. So I think those are the underlying motivations from which thinking about death, thinking about vulnerability, thinking about what makes life meaningful, thinking about politics, all of those things emerge. Is there, is there something different about today's situation, like uh, you mentioned, politically, um, so socially, culturally, is there something that you've noticed change at all? Or would you say that these are somewhat universal questions, as issues of, you know, how to live better and how to accept uh, life in, in the face of suffering, these kinds of things? I know on one level, especially with certain religious texts, you can see this as a pretty much a universal question. But in other cases, you know, we're dealing with a very specific political situation, especially North America lately, uh, where a lot of things seem to come up in the news that seem – uh, seem quite different than previous generations or, or the recent past. When you're when you're focusing on these things, do you think very contextually, or do you think very very much in terms of a sort somewhat universal? I know that's not necessarily a privileged word in certain circles, but do you think of a general idea, or do you think of a, a specific context, or or both? I don't know. Well, let me say this to start. I tend to have. My writing tends to fall into two categories. There's the political category and there's the sort of thinking about life category. Uh, and for a while, I noticed I was I write a, a book on one and then a book on the other and then swing back, write the book on one and the other. Um, when I'm thinking about the, the issues uh, around life, uh, I tend to think the word universal is fine. We could just say, if, I guess, if we want to be more precise about it, these are issues of longstanding in many cultures. <laughs> All right. And, and that's how, and so I don't think as contextually about those. But when I think about the political stuff, then there's a lot of context that comes in. Now, more recently, I've been doing political organizing. I'm sure you're aware, Chris, that there was this presidential election. Yeah, and, I've heard about that. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> it's motivated a lot of people. And I, I've done a lot of political organizing over the years. And the last couple of years, even, even in the run up to this election, I uh, found myself doing a lot more organizing. And, and when I'm doing political organizing, I tend not to want to write about it. Uh, I think it's like, OK, the political organizing is enough. So I, I don't think it's an accident that my last two, now three book manuscripts are not political. Uh, they've, I've been writing them over the last few years when I've been doing more organizing. So I think in trying to get a balance in my own life, I'll write more about politics when I'm not organizing and more about life when I am an organizer. Hmm. That's an interesting uh that's an interesting way of approaching it. Seems uh seems fairly healthy, I would say. Do you find it is it working? I, well, I think so because it's it's so easy to get, and particularly with the, you know, the current presidential, what, what should we call it? Situation. Dumpster. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I call it dumpster fire. <laughs> <laughs> that, that people attend, that, and, I, and, and I'm working with a lot of people to help them understand how organizing works, that have never done this before. And there's a tendency to get overwhelmed, right? Because, you know, the president's going to do something outrageous every day. And then people are going to get upset about this. And I tell them, pick what you're going to focus on to, and to make it better and work on that thing and don't get overwhelmed every day. Mm -hmm. But if I'm out there doing that and I'm doing nothing but thinking about politics 24-7, I'm going to get overwhelmed. So this gives me a chance to move away from the politics into some other aspects of philosophy. And, and I, mean, I find these thinking about these things compelling. I find philosophy, a lot of philosophy to be quite beautiful. And it allows me to go into a realm that may be significant for people's lives, 
uh, but also is is a, a compelling realm to be in. Uh, and uh, and so I'm not getting overwhelmed by the politics, the same as I'm telling people they shouldn't be getting overwhelmed by it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's one of the more interesting things that I found uh, when picking up your book and after reading it is that, yeah, you don't really talk about politics in here. And yet me personally, and uh, as you said, you and a lot of people are getting you know frustrated or trying to deal with political situations almost on a daily basis with new things that are bothering us or things – I mean the news – uh, Facebook and uh, and other sources of online information are always going to be bombarding us with the most outrageous things because uh, for no other reason, clickbait advertising, uh, it works best when there are outrageous things going on, right? So it can be very easy to feel bombarded, which is one of the reasons I picked up this book is uh, because I was attracted to the idea of vulnerability and how to uh, deal with or think about a fragile life. And so while the book itself doesn't necessarily seem at least uh, overly political, it fits very nicely, at least for me, within the questions I'm asking in relation to politics. So I found it to be really helpful. Well, the, the great theologian, Harvey Cox, once he wrote a book, Feast of Fools. And at the beginning of the book, he makes a distinction that I've always carried with me. Uh, he makes a distinction between what he calls world changers and life celebrators. So, you know, world changers see what's bad and want to change it. Life celebrators see what's beautiful in the world and want to immerse in it. And what Cox says, and I think this is right, is that the trick is to somehow integrate these two. Because if you're a life celebrator and you're failing to see the suffering that goes on around you and failing to address it, there's a certain self-absorption to that. But if you're a world changer and you see everything is bad and everything is needed to be changed, it's not simply that you become bitter, which has happened. I think some people become dangerous. Uh, they just uh, they want people to change. They can't they can't let go. Uh, and so, it, what I think a lot of us want to do is figure out how do we balance our will changing and our life celebrating. Uh, and I think in in my philosophy and in other people in other ways, we try to balance that so that we don't miss what's beautiful in the world that we inhabit, uh, and yet recognize right this, that there is suffering and exploitation and oppression and discrimination and this needs us to address it as well i think that's an excellent way to to wrap up this conversation because i think that summarizes a lot of uh, a lot of things that people can get from from your work in conversation with a lot of other people's and uh, that's one of the things that i think makes it really a, a strong book but i wanted to uh, th- thank you very much for speaking with me today about this Uh, Chris, it's been my honor. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you doing these, these podcasts.